In this video, we're going to talk about the solution to the AP Statistics 2022 FRQ exam, question number four. This question dealt with a confidence interval for a population proportion. Let's dive right into it. So a survey conducted by a National Research Center asked a random sample of 920 teenagers in the United States how often they use a video streaming service. From the sample, 59% answered that they use a video streaming service. First thing I'm gonna do right now is I'm gonna identify that as a P hat, that is a sample proportion. The 59% came from a sample of 920 teenagers. That is not a population parameter. It is just a sample proportion. All right, they want us to utilize that information to construct and interpret a 95% confidence interval for the proportion of all teenagers in the United States who would respond that they use a video streaming service every day. I'm actually shocked. I would think that it's even more than 59% that use a video streaming service every day, but you know, who knows? The data is the data. So they want me to construct a confidence interval for the true P, the true proportion for all teenagers that use a video streaming service um, every single day. All right, so for a conference interval, I follow what's called a four-step procedure. So here is my four-step procedure. Sorry that each step got labeled number one. They should be labeled one, two, three, four. I apologize for that. So uh, the four-step method that I utilize for finding a confidence interval is this. Step one, name the type of confidence interval you are using and describe what you are estimating in context. So hopefully by now you've learned that there are several types of confidence intervals, so we have to make sure we name the specific one we need. And don't ever forget to say in context what it is we're trying to actually find. Check the necessary conditions for the proper sampling distribution, as the idea of a sampling distribution is key to a confidence interval. Use the proper formula to calculate the interval. So the step three is like actually doing the work to find the interval. And then step four is to interpret the interval in context. That's the one step that a lot of students forget about. So I'm gonna go ahead and walk through this problem following the four step procedure. So the first two steps is honestly just kind of a lot of writing. Step one, we are going to use a one sample Z interval for the proportion of all teenagers in the United States who would respond that they use a video streaming service every day. So this is the name of our sample. Anytime you are looking for a sample proportion, or excuse me, a population proportion, utilizing a sample proportion, that is called a one sample Z interval. And then I have to also say what I'm using that interval to try to find. And that's literally just copying what's back from the problem. We're trying to find the proportion of all teenagers in the United States who would respond that they use a video streaming service every day. Don't shortcut that. That was literally in the question. You know, if you go back to the original question, that was literally exactly what it told me to find. But you do need into step one to just repeat that and don't shortcut it. Don't try to make it easier on yourself by using less words. Just copy. It's really that simple. All right, step two are those conditions that have to be checked. Even though we're not actually going to build a sampling distribution, the idea of a confidence interval stems from the existence of the sampling distribution. And we know that sampling distribution should have the true P right in the center. And it, of course, should be normal. So we have to check and make sure that that sampling distribution is everything we want it to be. So first, the first uh, condition to check is that it must be random to avoid being biased. So the sample of 9 to 20 teenagers was said, was said to be selected randomly to avoid bias. This allows us to make generalizations from the data to the population. The second condition is that the sample must be under 10% of the population. I would definitely agree that there are probably millions of teenagers in the United States, so 920 teenagers is definitely less than 10% all from all of them to assume independence between our samples. And then finally, in order to use the normal model, we do have to have 10 or more successes and 10 or more failures. So in our sample, we had 920 people, 59% of them responded that they do use a video streaming service every day. That's how I got the 542.8. More than likely, it was 543 if it was an actual sample. But again, it's okay. Uh, but the key thing is that it's more than 10, 10 or more. And then I also took the 920 students and I took the 41% that obviously responded they do not use a video streaming service. And that's how I got the 377.2 failures. So since both of those values are 10 or larger, the sampling distribution will be approximately normal. Those are the same conditions that have to be checked anytime you utilize a sampling distribution, especially in an inference procedure. 
All right, now we get to the fun part. This is actually the part that most kids actually do really well at, and that is going ahead and actually constructing the interval. So first, uh, they do recommend on the AP exam that you write down the formula that you're going to use. So the formula for a one sample Z interval looking for a population parameter is to start with your P hat. That was your actual sample. For us, that was the 0.59. And then we're going to go up and down this entire back part that we're adding and subtracting is known as the margin of error. The margin of error is a combination of two values. First, the Z star. Now, they did ask us to be 95% confident. So the Z star for 95% confident is 1.96. I don't want to spend a ton of time in this video. This video is meant to just go over the solution, but to explain where that came from. But essentially, if we're going to talk about the middle 95% of samples, we need to figure out the Z star that marks the top and bottom of those middle 95%. And if there's 95% in the middle, that means there's 2.5% at the bottom and 2.5% at the top. Sorry for my terrible drawing here. But if you do an invert norm on your calculator for that bottom 2.5%, that will give you a Z score of negative 1.96. And obviously the positive 1.96 would be where that interval ends. So that's exactly where we get the plus or minus 1.96 from. All right, and then we have our standard error. So the standard error for a um, sample proportion is the square root of p hat times 1 minus p hat divided by m. So, of course, in my square root, I have the 0.59. That was our sample proportion. And the opposite would be the failure proportions, I guess. That would be the 0.41 and then divided by our um, 920, our sample size. So what you could do is go ahead and grab a calculator. You could actually calculate that entire back part all together. So we take 1.96, multiply by, just grab a giant square root, 0.59 times 0.41 divided by 920, putting all of that together. And it's cool because your calculator could do all the order of operations and do it all together. So that's the 0.032. I rounded that right there to 0.032. That's where I got that margin of error from. And then now if I simply take that 0.59 and we add the 0.032, we get the top of our interval, 0.622. Take the 0.59 and subtract the 0.032, and we get the bottom of our interval, 0.558. So our confidence interval is 0.558 to 0.622. Now for step four, interpreting the interval in context. This is a key part that a lot of kids forget about. So let's walk through it. All we're doing here is saying exactly what this interval finds. So we are 95% confident that proportion of all teenagers in the United States who would respond that they use a streaming service every day is somewhere between 0.558 and 0.66 or 0.622. You're more than welcome to call that 55.8%. And 62.2%. Uh, but a couple key things here. Make sure we start off with we're 95% confident because this is not a guarantee. It's not guaranteed 100% confidence, only 95% confident. And again, what are we looking for? The proportion of all teenagers in the United States that would use a video streaming service every day is somewhere between the 55.8% and the 62.2%. So a pretty simple interpretation there. Hopefully you walk through those. If you really have no idea how to construct a confidence interval, then you probably should go back and watch some of my earlier videos that I have in my um, YouTube channel of just, you know, the whole process in of itself, how to do it all. All right, part B here said, based on the confidence interval in part A, do the sample data provide convincing evidence that the proportion of all teenagers in the United States who respond that they use a video streaming service every day is not 0.5? So is there evidence that the true proportion of teenagers that use a video streaming service every day is not 0.5? And again, you can make that a 50% in your head if you'd like. I said yes because my interval is entirely above 0.5. I have evidence to believe that the proportion of all U.S. teenagers that use a video streaming service every day is more than 50%. My interval indicates that any value from 55.8% to 62.2% is plausible. Not a guarantee, but I am confident, 95% confident, that any value in my interval, as low as 55.8% to as high as 62.2%, is the true proportion. Hence, I'm very confident it's not 50%. So since 50% is not in my interval, I do have convincing evidence the proportion is not 50%. So keep in mind a couple of things here. First off, I always tell kids, they ask you a question. Start off by answering it. 
Does the data provide convincing evidence? So start off with yes or no. So the very first thing I should start off with is yes, I, I do have evidence that it's not 50%. And then you got to back it up with why. Well, why? Because my interval is what I believe the truth to be and 50% is well below not in my interval. So I do have evidence that the proportion is not 50%. So notice how I kind of repeated myself there at the end. I simply said, hey, I do have that convincing evidence. So again, I'm saying, yes, I do have that convincing evidence that the proportion is not 50%. I'm literally answering the exact question they said. That's a key thing to think about when you're taking any um, question in the AP stats exam is don't ever forget to answer what it says. Some kids will do a bunch of writing, but they never actually answer the question. All right, now down here below, this is optional. You do not have to have this, but I think it's important to point out that if the truth was 50%, like if I'm wrong, then that simply means that my sample of 59% would have been very, very unlikely to occur. And I don't believe in unlikely things happening. That's why I think I'm right. So again, you do not have to have this bottom part. It's not a requirement for the question. This top part is a beautiful, gorgeous answer. But I'm just trying to point out that you should always consider that, you know, maybe 50% is right. I mean, I'm not 100% confident that my interval contains the truth. So if the truth was 50%, then that would only mean that my sample was an unbelievably crazy sample and it should never have happened but I don't believe in samples that should not happen actually happening, right? That is why I'm very confident that I believe that the answer is somewhere above 50%, being that it's not 50%. All right, that's it for question number four for the 2022 exam. Hopefully I made it pretty easy for you.